a weekly basis every Monday by Professor Mark Brinkart, who collates all the information that is available on the internet. Sometimes we get lost looking at it, and he presents them here during our weekly news in English. Today we are speaking about the new lockdown measures here in Malta and various ideas of cures and vaccines. But before we start on those two topics, I'd like to address um, some questions that have been sent in by yourselves. Good evening. Good evening, Professor. Good evening, yeah. How Good are evening. you? I'm all right, thank you. And you? <laughs> thank you very much. We've had uh, some messages from the public about various um, guests we've had during our evening news. And I'd like you perhaps to address them very briefly because I know you've got a lot to speak about today. The first was um, Professor Marmara's statistics regarding the second phase. What are your comments about that? Well, Professor Marmara is a very good statistician and he's managed to get a lot of things right uh, when people did not believe him. Um, and, um, and certainly a statistician gives us a general direction. But when we are dealing with something like a coronavirus, like an epidemic, there are so many variables that the least change can end up having very different profound results. This is called the chaos theory, basically. It's, it's, a, it's a philosophy and a physics, and, and um, it was an attempt to predict weather. Weather is now much better predicted than it used to be, but that's because a lot of variables are put in. Uh, and, and suffice to say, an intervention, a new drug, a new vaccine, or people being extra careful or less careful can have profound changes uh, several steps down the road. Um, I, my personal opinion is that, that, that there undoubtedly is going to be a reservoir of virus left here. Um, a small a small amount of people who still have this virus, uh, even because we don't know how long it lasts in an individual. But if that small nucleus of, group of patients finds a vulnerable institution, like an old people's home, or they visit the pole, then we will see an explosion. Yes. And this yes. we will call a second peak. But, you know, it depends on the definition of a second peak. I believe, I mean, the comments I, from other comments, I believe that they're very conservative and very realistic. That's yes, the comments so yes. I've had so far. Um, the uh, second... Yes, I mean, we've, seen, we've seen this happen. I mean, there are people who are giving us doom scenarios. And, and, uh, but, of course, they were, not, they were not including possibilities of intervention, yes, positive yes. intervention. And we've, we've ended up where we are today. But thankfully, through the efforts of everybody, you know, the part of health, people, being disciplined and so on. May I just address the Kawasaki disease in children, which yes. we brought up with yes. Professor Albert Fenech um, right. on Saturday. Um, mm -hmm. can, can you sort of uh, um, address mm -hmm. it? Um, yes. Professor Fenech did mention mm -hmm. that there's yeah. really nothing um, mm -hmm. to panic about. And your comments, please. Yes, well, well uh, uh, Kawasaki is, is an inflammation of the blood vessels, really, and endarteritis. It's called an immune condition. Uh, and it's presenting in children under five. Um, we do know that this uh, particular virus, it's a new virus and we're learning about it all the time, actually does affect the, uh, the lining of the blood vessels. It affects kidneys as well, but it is essentially a thrombotic-like condition as well, which increases your chance of thrombosis. In obstetrics, for example, our current um, guideline states that we're to cover everybody with anti-clotting uh, drugs, injections, clexin or heparin. Uh, with children, uh, this seems to be in a very, very tiny percentage, I have to tell you, a very tiny percentage of children. There seems to be an inflammation of these blood vessels, which if treated appropriately and quickly with immunoglobulins and high dose aspirin, will resolve. Um, but this is not nothing special because it is in common with any other coronavirus infection. Any other respiratory infection can set off the same inflammation of blood vessels in children. So really, here it is behaving like any other coronavirus. And this is not the only one. Or like any other severe um, respiratory inf inflammation, which sets off a respiratory infection, which sets off a, 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 an inflammation in your blood vessels. But in but general, in a very tiny percent. People should not really worry about. And it. it's, it's not. It, we range. did discuss that it's not um, life-threatening at all. So that's very positive. <laughs> yes. Thank and you for that. Range. There's certainly a small number of cases described in various countries, but you would find these cases anyway with any respiratory infection in children. Absolutely. Um, the very last short one, because I would like you to yeah. tackle what we're here about today. Um, Dr. Christopher De Guara. Yeah. Um, 
um, is heading a new online website, yes. which is under the patronage of His Excellency the President, yes. Dr. George Vella. Uh, could you kindly mm -hmm. explain very briefly what people should do to enroll into this sort of service? Well, this is one of the uh, online services that's available. The difference is that this is a, more of a charity. And, and, um, and, and, and basically, they've just got to go to the website of, of doctors.com um, or contact Chris Deguara. And it's, it's one of the um, lines, uh, one, one of the virtual um, methods for consultation of doctors who are enrolled in the system. So we encourage both GPs to enroll and we encourage um, specialists to enroll. And of course, we encourage patients to have a look at it. But yes. there are also others which patients have got a choice. Yes. And we will take a look at and it. And it, so it, like it is a one out. It is a facility that's free of charge, so I mean, hats off to all of them who support yeah, it. Yeah, it's not completely free of charge. There's no fee. <laughs> there's, 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 there's no, no fee. Absolutely, there's, there's no fee. fee. Which, is, which is slightly different. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> can we now address the updates of COVID-19 that you've got for us today, please? Right. So, so today, there's good news from Italy and from, uh, from the UK, especially from Spain, uh, in that the death rates are coming down. The UK have had the single lowest death rate now in months. It's about 250, um, which is still significant, of course. There's still a number of people dying, but it's coming down. The infection rate also seems to be coming down, and the number of patients in ITU is coming down. So much so that the Nightingale Hospital built um, built in the... Um, on the side of the of the uh, of, of, of the big wheel uh, on the other side of the Thames um, has been put on standby. You remember that this big hospital was built in, in a period of nine days by the army and called the Nightingale Ward, and it was a part of the Royal London and St Bart's actually, which we have in Malta here. Yeah. Uh, but it's hardly been used at all, and now it's on standby. So this is good news, really. Uh, although we're by no means out of the woods, the UK, like us, have decided to to start coming out of their type of lockdown. And lockdowns, I keep on emphasizing, come in different shapes and sizes. So what is lockdown to, to, to somewhere is not the same as lockdown in Italy or lockdown in Singapore. And our lockdown was different once again. It was a semi-lockdown. Um, but likewise, we are taking baby steps now to get out of this, this situation. We should not be um, uh, cavalier about the fact that we've only had three cases. Yesterday, we had nine cases. But really, it's, it's a reflection of how many tests are carried out. So on Saturday, well over a thousand tests were carried out. In some cases, people were walking in for a test. Uh, well, it's not as easy as that. Everybody should phone 111 and book an appointment, okay? But the point is, we had over a thousand tests. Yesterday, we had 700 and so tests. So there are still a number of cases out there who are asymptomatic. And yesterday, you remember that five of the cases were asymptomatic, had no symptoms at all. They just happened to be in teaching professions or whatever and decided to go just to get tested. Um, and the other two were pre-op cases, and they too were asymptomatic. So undoubtedly, there's a large number of patients, of people, uh, of Maltese co-citizens and, and inhabitants here, who are asymptomatic carriers of the virus. But the good news is that we do not have a, uh, this is not reflected in a huge uh, incidence of people being admitted to hospital. So whatever they are, they're still, you know, they are asymptomatic. And we calculate it's about double of what's normally found. Absolutely. Uh, we discussed very briefly um, yes. the phase three and your suggestions for it. Can we sort of um, tackle yes. that a bit? Yeah, here, here we're talking about vaccinations, okay? So there are two ways, well, a number of ways of, of, of stopping this. And we need to stop it because otherwise life will not return to normal. Plus, there is a morbidity. We still do not know what the long-term side effects of, uh, of this virus is on muscles, on kidneys, on testicles, and whatever, yeah? because there seems to be effects, uh, effects over there. Um, and and it's, it's a multi-organ disease. Uh, but on the other hand, many, many viruses do infect us, and many viruses do disappear and leave, leave no, no residue. Um, but really, we'd like to avoid having it, if possible, not just have it and recover. So, so one way of doing this is, is to either be isolated, as you know, or to isolate those people who are infected, so the virus can't spread from one person to another, feed and replicate. Um, and the third thing, the third, the, the third way is to wait for vaccination. Now, although people are saying there are variants of this uh, virus, they are not sufficiently ver ver uh, variable, if you like. The virus is not sufficiently changed to, to uh, make us um, not be optimistic over the vaccines. 
uh, and vaccines have moved at a very fast rate. There's been a lot of international cooperation, and and basically with a bit of genetic engineering, well, it's very clever genetic engineering, to be honest. <laughs> we now have uh, vaccines which are being in what's called phase two. A phase two study is where it's being tried on people. So there's a number of volunteers uh, in the UK. There's the Oxford group, and I've got 5,000 volunteers. Germany have got a similar vaccine. Um, and they're trusting on, on volunteers. And these are essentially light, normal viruses, cold viruses, which don't really cause us that much harm. And they've had a small tweak to their genes so that they produce a protein particular to COVID. This gives our immune system the opportunity to recognize that protein, build up immunity against it, uh, what are called the immunoglobulins, and, and, and um, attack, attack it. So that when they see the protein on the real COVID virus, there's a whole load of them uh, already ready, the, our immune system recognizes it and attacks it straight away. So in, in people who are, have got normal immunity, this works. And that's how this vaccine is going to work. Most vaccines have been developed along these lines. Uh, there are other types of vaccines which have been developed against COVID, but we won't go on to them. Otherwise, um, it will be, be take us too long. So. After phase two, there are these so-called phase three. Yes. Now, if we are to wait until phase four, until they're until they're on the market, with these vaccines, we will have to wait for a good, you know, twelve to eighteen months at least. I think we're, we're going to have to speak about phase four. Yeah. Next yes. week. Next okay. week. So, so phase three, the idea is that perhaps if we know that there's a lot of safety margins and then things have gone well, then perhaps we in Malta here could be an ideal site for a phase three study, which would mean that essentially we'll have vaccines here available to us a year ahead of before they are released. And I think that given adequate safeguards and use on appropriate volunteers who are young, fit, and so on and so forth, with the track record that these uh, that these tried to test vaccines have, knowing that there are that these are replicas of old vaccines actually, with, with a, a bit tweaked in. Then I think I think this will enable us to have uh, immunity in our population at a much quicker rate than would otherwise happen. Remember that the people are probably going to be selfish yeah? and keep the vaccines for themselves. Thank uh, you very much. Countries. Thank you, Professor Brinkart. Once again, thank you. The time always seems very short when you're here. Thank you very much. We'll see you next week. Thank you. That was uh, Professor Mark Brinkart with his um, weekly update on COVID. Any questions, do send them in as you've done this week and we'll address them next week. And tomorrow I've got with me um, Dr. Joe Giglio. I'll see you tomorrow at 5.40. The news in Maltese will air at 7.30 tonight. For Net News, I'm Leah Hogg. Good night.